Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody and uh, to Protecting Our Lakes and Shorelines. Um, it's a virtual series for those living on or recreating on um, in our local lakes and waterways. Uh, this was developed by uh, friends of the Spider Lake and Rennie Lake um, associations here in, in uh, Northern Michigan. So uh, today our uh, speaker is going to be uh, Ann St. Amon and it's um, going to be talking about life below the surface, a dip into the uh, hidden world of algae. Uh, but before we get started, uh, again, I'd like to repeat a couple of housekeeping um, things uh, that we are recording this. Uh, should be available next week. Uh, we will send out a link to everybody who's participated in this uh, uh, series and uh, in this particular one. And um, if you would, please um, put where you're from in the chat box and, um, and also um, what you value most about the water that you use and uh, how you use it and what you value most about water besides subsistence. You know, how do you use it? Are you a fisher person? Are you... Uh, recreationist, uh, how do you use the water? Do you live on a lake or, or what? So it'd be interesting just to, to hear the different ways that people use our uh, inland lakes. I actually uh, grew up on a spider lake myself. And uh, so inland lakes are near and dear to my heart. So uh, before we get started with the uh, presentation, um, uh, Anne's presentation, I'd like to uh, give you a little background on the Grand Traverse Conservation District. Um, Got to go the other way. Um, there. Um, the Grand Traverse Conservation District, our mission is to lead, facilitate, and inspire exploration, appreciation, conservation, and restoration of our natural world. What we do, we provide accessible gateways to the natural world. We restore and, and care for natural areas. Uh, through our invasive species management program and the Boardman River program and we restore and protect um, the watershed and we work to keep our local farms sustainable. We educate the future generation of conservation leaders uh, here at the Boardman River Nature Center and uh, we've been around uh, 80 years. This is our 80th year. Um, it feels like I've been around for like most of that but only of almost nearly 30 years I've been working for the Grand Traverse Conservation District and my primary position has been um, the restoration and protection of the Borden River and its watershed. And I'm also a conservation team leader. We manage in, uh, over 3,000 acres of public parkland here in Grand Traverse County. Most of that is along the Borden River. Um, next, whoops, so back up, went, went too far. Okay, how you can get involved with the conservation districts, become a volunteer, uh, promote, uh, responsible engagement with the outdoors. That's a big one. Uh, visit the Nature Center here uh, off Cass Road and uh, participate in one of our programs or events. And then also you can donate uh, to the Conservation District and those that are um, live or reside in Grand Traverse County. Uh, thank you for your support of the millage that we received a couple years ago. Um, I can say as being here, like I said, for almost three decades, that has been a game changer for us and to be able to provide the type of services we do. So thank you very much. And um, we'll talk about more on this a little bit later, but right now I would like to uh, introduce uh, Ralph Bednars and um, let's see, and Ralph is a limnologist. Um, uh, it was a retired limnologist with the state, and um, he's going to introduce Ann. So go ahead, Ralph. Thanks, Steve. Hello, everyone. My name is Ralph Bednars. Thank you all for participating in the third annual Protecting Our Inland Lakes and Shorelands, the Poll Series. Polls was started by the Friends of Spider Lake, Carol Kusel and Patty Hersberger in 2019. I joined the Polls team, and we partnered with the Grand Traverse Conservation District to host the poll series last year. We have been able to bring to the local lake community some very knowledgeable and interesting speakers on various aspects of lake and lakeshore ecology, best management practices, and threats. We held polls as a virtual event last year, and we are continuing the virtual format for the 2021 Polls Lunch and Learn series. For today's event, we have another excellent speaker, Dr. Ann St. Amon. Dr. St. Amand is president and owner of FICO Tech Incorporated, which she formed in 1990. 
She has over 35 years of experience identifying and enumerating over 42,000 algal samples from all over North America. She specializes in rapid water quality assessment and harmful algal bloom assessment and mitigation. Her company has completed programming on an extensive data management system containing information on nearly 34,000 different aquatic organisms and belongs to numerous professional societies and she is an active reviewer and associate editor for the Journal of Lake and Reservoir Management. She has been involved as an expert witness in forensic and ecological impact investigations, as well as serves on two committees relating to public health issues surrounding toxic blooming algal at the state level. Dr. St. Amon holds a BS from Purdue University and a PhD in aquatic ecology from the University of Notre Dame, as well as postdoctoral experience at UND. Anne, welcome and thank you for continuing the 2021 whole series with Life Below the Surface, a dip into the hidden world of algae. And the virtual stage is yours. All righty. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And I was telling Ralph earlier that um, really the only important things are that I love algae and that I um, have four kids and two grandkids and uh, everything else is kind of tangential to that. So, so we're gonna talk today about algae. Um, I understand that we have a group here that has a lot of variation in how much um, technical knowledge they have about algae, but a lot of you actually have a ton of knowledge. You just may not, may not see it the same way that, that some others see it. And so we're gonna, um, we're going to kind of touch both the, the technical part and just the very cool part of it. They're going to make my slides available as well. So, um, and I have some bonus slides at the end for ID stuff uh, for those of you who are microscope geeks. So let's get started. Um, this is my contact information. So if you have questions that we don't have time to answer or you have pictures you want to send me, um, my thing is, is that I'll accept pictures or samples from anybody. And uh, as long as there's no report required and no timeline, generally I get to them pretty fast. Um, so, and I've done quite a few actually uh, for different organizations in the past month and a half or so. If you have questions, put them in the chat and then um, we'll answer all, I'll answer all the questions with help from, um, from everybody at the end. So this is why we're all here, right? Um, what is algae and, and why should we care? And um, the, the interesting part about this question is, is that, uh, you know, it's everywhere, right? It's not just in the water, it's in the air, it's on the surfaces, it's on trees, it's on sidewalks, it's in puddles, it's on our roofs, it's everywhere. Um, but we tend not to notice it unless it causes us some sort of issue, right? And so let's talk about this. And let's talk about why it's so hard. And we have to have a discussion about phylogeny, what we call phylogeny, which is essentially just how we class things. So as humans, we tend to think in terms of traditional kingdoms, right? It's an animal, it's a fungus, it's a plant, it's a bacteria. Um, we, we like to compartmentalize things so we can discuss it. And, um, but, you know, and because of that, we like, okay, well, a dog is a dog, right? They're easily, our, our classes and categories are easily recognizable to us as humans. And so if I say dog, then you get a mind picture. Um, sometimes it's a cute little puppy. Sometimes it's a big dog. Sometimes it's a little dog. But, but you got dog down pretty well. If I were to say cat, same thing. You got cat down pretty well. You got bird down pretty well. The problem is with algae is that algae cross kingdoms. And so we have algae over here as uh, bacteria, we have them over here as true plants, and we have them here as protists. And so they cross all of these different kingdoms, which makes it really hard to talk about them. And, um, and that creates a lot of confusion. The only thing that algae have in common is that they all have chlorophyll A. So our group, this, this evolutionary trash can of ours called algae, the thing that they do is photosynthesize and they do it in the presence of oxygen um, and create oxygen while they're doing it. And so all algae have chlorophyll A and all algae photosynthesize. And after that, there's no commonalities. <laughs> so um, they can be huge, think kelp, or they can be teeny tiny, 
um, which means that you need a microscope like I have next to me. If we have time, I'm gonna show you something uh, at the end of the talk. But, but in essence, all they do is have chlorophyll A and they photosynthesize. So let's talk about the good and the bad and the ugly. Um, when I ask kids this question, it's funny. If, they're, if their parents are, are old, uh, old Western fans, they know this movie. And if they, they don't, then they have no idea what I'm talking about. And they think I'm talking about cowboys and aliens. So the good, right? Not all algae are bad. And in terms of ecosystem services, and all that means is, is that, um, you know, they're providing something that we need as humans. And those things are either direct benefits, like they allow us to be here, right? They are responsible as the algae for 50 to 80% of the total oxygen in our atmosphere. Most of that is marine, but a lot of it's freshwater now as well and, and wetland generated. They provide food, both directly as seaweeds, um, and, and cultures, as well as feeding the things that the fish we eat eat or marine mammals that we eat eat. And so they are hugely important for food and they are part of this whole milieu of biodiversity. And as humans, whether we realize it or not, we are reliant on biodiversity. That's what allows our earth to function biologically continuously. Some things go extinct, new species come along, the more choices you have, the more chance you're gonna have something that will be viable come some event. And the closest I can think about when we're talking about the lack of biodiversity is if you're a gardener. Um, if you have all of one thing, say hostas, and you have deer, which we have a ton of, if you have a family of deer walk through and they eat all your hostas, you're done. Um, but if you have hostas and you have daylilies and you have like I do natives in my yard, like New Jersey tea and downy sunflower, there's going to be plants left. And those plants that are left will continue to photosynthesize and make it look nice while those other plants have to recover from being munched to the ground by a hungry deer. Um, they also impact indirect packs like quality of life. Um, I'm pretty sure that everybody on this call is here because we love the water in some way, shape or form. We either fish or we boat or we swim. Or like me, I, I am just uh, naturally or unnaturally drawn to the water wherever I am. Um, and so I love the water. I love to be near the water. It lowers my stress level. It makes me happy. And so that is uh, that quality of life actually is huge. Um, and it's huge to us as humans. And then there's just the, it's super cool algae, right? That's uh, a hashtag I use on my website. I love algae. Um, as a friend of mine put it yesterday, it's my hobby um, and it consumes my life. And so these are all things that are positive and good and there's good algae and we don't have great bass if those bass don't have zooplankton to eat, which have good algae to eat. So it's not all bad. The bad part about this, depending on your, on your point of view is, is that trying to quantify and characterize these things is hard. They're complicated. The names are constantly changing. Um, and some days I'm just better at it than others. Um, I see a lot of different algae from a lot of different systems. And that makes me pretty good as a generalist, not always so good as a, as a specialist. And the reason for that is that um, different, uh, different countries, different continents, different groups use different taxonomy schemes. And that is because of that evolutionary trash can issue. So, it's uh, depending on, you know, th this is actually, if you're, if you're generally looking for a great book that is functionally based, functional group based, this uh, Freshwater Algae of Australia is awesome. Um, but it's a little different than this book from the UK, which is a little different from the book we tend to use in the US. And so because of that, it gets confusing. So at the talk, start of every taxonomy or grouping talk I give, I'm like, okay, well, here's the book we're using. We use we're at all. And, and we use this classification and this classification is a functional group classification. I'm a, I'm a trained ecologist and I use taxonomy. So um, that lets me look at it a little different. I'm always, uh, I'm always interested in form and function. Um, and then where you put it is, is kind of secondary to that as long as I understand the biology. And in this talk, we're gonna be focusing on four major groups, the greens, the blue greens, the cyanophyta, the chrysophytes, the golden browns, and the diatoms. Um, some, some of these have common names, some don't. So the cryptophyta, they get cryptomonads, euglenophyta get euglenoids, um, but these others have somewhat common names. 
And when we talk about these different groups, this is kind of what they look like compared to each other. So some of these are flagellated, like the glenophytes, the euglenoids. Um, most of us have seen that in high school. Uh, cryptomonads are, are almost all flagellated. The cyanophytes do not have flagellated members. They're, they move, believe it or not, but, um, but not fast and not with flagella. And then these other groups, you guys are probably, many of you are familiar with, with Cara or stonewort. Um, and then, and then these are the basic divisions. And again, we're interested in the green algae, the golden browns, the uh, blue greens, and the diatoms. So of the, of the four lakes, I'm gonna kind of give a preview at the end. Those are, those are the algae we're gonna look at. So we got two different kinds of algae. We have ones that are up in the water column. Those are called planktonic. And for the green algae, there's some pretty common ones, pseudopediastrum, desmodesmus. If you were to grab a, a drop of water, you would very likely see one of these algae in it. Oh, this is super common, looks a little football. Um, Dictyosphirium and Mesitosphirium. These are really super common green algae. They're all good algae. And most of them are edible algae. So if you're a zooplankton and a fish, you're happy these things are present. Then we have mat formers, which tend to either be in big groupings in the water, we'll talk about that with Spider Lake, or on the bottom. And that includes Clodophora, which can be a problem uh, for the Great Lakes. Uh, Spirogyra, that's another one a lot of people recognize. Hydrodictyon, water net, it's one of the few algae with a common name. And uh, Edegonium and Edegonal Edegonales, also pretty common in the littoral area, the side areas of lakes. And then let's talk about the golden browns. And this is a little more important for Chandler Lake and for Torch Lake, uh, kind of both with this and the diatoms. So we have things like Cynura, Euglenopsis, Denobrian, and Chrysosphrella. These are all super common North Michigan uh, taxa. I see them all the time. And, um, and they're all pretty, they're all actually pretty cool. Uh, and they're pretty common. We talk about the planktonic. Remember, planktonic means up in the water. So planktonic diatoms include things like Alicosyra and Cyclotella. These are what we call centric diatoms. They look like little discs in the water. Asterianella, most people will recognize this once they've seen it once in Fragilaria. Again, super common in the water. And then the ugly. So the good is these things are super cool. We need them in order to survive. They're fun to look at. They're associated with a, with a quality of life for us. The bad is they're hard to characterize and quantify. That's a lot of information. I go over those again a little bit. Um, and then the fact that this is why many of us are probably here because we have a concern. And our concern is usually somewhere rooted around the presence or the possibility of having scums on the water and toxins present and dead fish and uh, the ability, a lack of ability to use the lake. So we have to have a talk about what an algae bloom actually is. We use it a lot, um, but there is no true definition of an algal bloom other than loosely defined as color in the water. Now it becomes a HAB or an HCB when you add toxins or fish kills to that. So there is a, a lot of movement um, in aquatic ecology to not use HAB um, because HAB can describe a lot of different kinds of algae in a lot of different habitats. I grew up in Florida, and so I, when somebody says HAB, my first thing is to a red tide, um, because I grew up in Sarasota, Florida, and we have a lot of red tides, or it could be brown tide, which is diatom driven, or brown algae driven. So the, the idea is, is that if we use HCB or harmful cyanophyte bloom, it's specific to blue-green algae, which is, you know, about 99% of the blue-green algal blooms um, that can cause a problem are in freshwater. There's a few saltwater ones, but for the most part, they're freshwater. So you're going to kind of see my slides use both of those, but I try to use the new term because uh, the more I use it, the more comfortable I'll get with it. Um, either one will work, but I'm trying to use that HCB term. So when we talk about algal problems, we, we think about, okay, well, we know that usually algal problems are associated with a bloom of some sort, top or bottom, planktonic or, or matte on the bottom. And that leads to poor visibility, to uh, more heightened color in the water, clumps of algae floating, sometimes those smell, sometimes they're, they're rotting, um, a slimy feel to the water sometimes. And it just has a general skanky look. I love that word. Um, and so it's just yucky to look at, right? Yucky to smell, yucky to look at. 
And what that means technically is, is that anytime you see that kind of overgrowth, just like in a terrestrial garden or in your garden, if you see all weeds, that means there's an imbalance, right? And so that means there's gonna be physical impacts on the system, think, uh, think fish, right? They're not gonna be able to swim through huge uh, stands of myriophyllum or coontail. And so that's gonna cause problems, right? Water quality alterations, low oxygen, aesthetic impairment. As humans, we're not gonna notice it until there's a problem. So you're gonna come upon a beautiful lake and you're gonna go, oh, that's awesome. But you're not gonna think problem until it smells yucky or you see dead fish or there's huge, um, huge blooms on the water, right? We are cute as humans to notice issues. So what does that mean? Well, when we talk about taste and odor, which is one of the first things you might notice, that means that at, at, any, at, at a high enough density, all algae can make, the, can make uh, compounds that taste and smell yucky. But there's two primary ones, geosmin and MIB, along with a whole lot of others. Uh, this algae on here is called cyanura, and it makes <laughs> literally a chemical called fishy. Um, as well as a few, other, a few other chemicals that are associated with chrysophytes or golden brown algae. And so all algae can produce taste and odor compounds if there's enough of it and it's yucky enough, but most of them in the chrysophytes and the blue greens are gonna produce either geosmin or MIB. And uh, you can, as a human, detect those at super low concentrations. So one of the things water treatment plants do is actually a jar test where they just have a cup of water with a bell jar over it and Really, they pay people to smell it when you remove the gel, when you move the jar. So um, you can detect it really low concentrations. And the reason is, is that some of those algae actually that can produce TNO uh, compounds also produce toxins. And so as a human, you're cued to avoid those water supplies that have that smell with them. And toxins, which is probably many of the people here are concerned about algal toxins. It's in the news a lot. So we got three classes, hepatotoxins, neurotoxins, and dermatoxins. That's about as concentrated as I'm going to get because we're kind of limited in time. But, um, but, you know, all of those toxins are produced uh, by different kinds of algae. Some algae produce this, uh, multiple toxins, some only produce one. Um, so that can be exciting. And um, just because they can doesn't mean they are or that they will. And so uh, it's, um, you know, difficult when you're trying to give somebody an idea of how much risk there is in their system and not knowing whether the algae that are present are the ones that can. That's what where I come in, that's what I do 95% of my time is do assessments of algal populations and determine I do or don't have a toxin producer and then sending that off for toxin analysis. And if there's a lot of money, which there almost never is, and a lot of time, which there almost never is, then doing an analysis of the genetics, is the gene there, is it present, can uh, we detect whether it's turned on or not? So um, one of the reasons I wanted to make sure that the slides were handed out is these are all um, links to different groups across different websites across the country. One of them is uh, Eagles, um, which I just sort of laugh at. It's our current uh, environmental organization in Michigan. Um, Eagles, uh, a harmful algal blooms page. NOMS, uh, ITRC, I'm gonna mention that in just a minute. Um, Turns out that Eagle and the ITRC have a visual guide online. And so that may prove very helpful to you. If you come across your lake or something happens, changes, and you're like, oh, do I need to be concerned or not? Let me look at some images and then I'll kind of know who to contact about what to do. There's just some really good information here. Um, it's a little buried on the EPA and the USGS sites, um, but, but these other four sites actually have a, a pretty nice presentation of information. So let's talk about some of the planktonic blue greens, right? So notice that um, we didn't get into the ugly with the planktonic chrysophytes or the planktonic greens or even the matte greens. Um, we're, we're getting into the ugly and the blue greens and because those are the ones that tend to produce toxin. So remember that these guys are bacteria. They're cyanobacteria. And so they act like bacteria. They have some specialized cells. Um, that help them compete effectively. They're old, they're, they're a couple billion years old. They've been surviving for a really long time. And so they're good at it. And, um, and they developed in this world when there was warmer temps, a lot of minerals in the water, 
and a lot of um, necessity to compete well. So the big ones are phanosomonin, dolicospermum, that's the old anabena, veronin chinia, uh, the old coelospherium, and microcystis. These are, there's tons, but these are some of the primary planktonic ones, which means they're up in the water and they all have a way to stay up in the water. And that's this stuff right here. Those are gas vesicles. They're gas uh, uh, ways to stay up in the water and make it more buoyant. Um, kind of think uh, a boat and displacement. Um, this is brown, Delixiferum is brown because it has so many uh, gas vesicles in it. This is red because I have this super cool thing on my microscope called epifluorescence. I shine a light at the algae, the algae shine light back at me. It's like winking at each other. Um, it's awesome, I love it, and it always keeps me interested. It makes it easy for me to see the algae and to ID them. So given that we know that these guys all float, that they have this structure internal to their cells, which helps them stay up, you can use something called a jar test if you are concerned about what might be a blue-green bloom in your lake. Um, it has some caveats, but it actually works pretty well. So you collect a sample in just a regular jar, a water bottle, I've done it in just a, you know, an Aquafina bottle, whatever you have. And um, so you're gonna collect your water sample and you're gonna let it sit. It doesn't take long, just a few minutes, but up to 15, 20 minutes maybe. And one of two things is gonna happen. Either everything's gonna go down to the bottom if it's planktonic algae. If you got duckweed or water meal, they're gonna float. Um, but they're also gonna be huge, which is gonna be your clue that they're plants. They're gonna be able, in this jar, you're gonna be able to see little roots come down. So blue greens can't have roots. And so it's either gonna go down to the bottom in which case it might not be lovely, but probably not gonna be a health issue or a risk to your pets, or it's gonna do something like this. Something like this requires some more due diligence. That means you have buoyant blue greens in your system, as long as there's no roots, as long as they're not, you can't see plant fronds in there, um, which would tell you it was a duckweed or a water meal. And so this C is the one that you need to be most concerned about. And that's the point at which you're most likely gonna contact somebody. So um, this is not 100%, it's not foolproof, but it's, a pre it's gonna give you 60 to 80% confidence that you have something that you need to be concerned about. And um, it's not gonna help you much when it comes to these guys. So that mostly applies to planktonic ones. Um, these other are mat forming blue greens that tend to be off the bottom or they float up from the bottom. They don't have gas vesicles. They might trap oxygen in their mats, but they themselves do not have gas vesicles like microsyra, formidium, oscillatoria. There's another one called microcoleus. These are a lot more innocuous. And if they don't float to the surface, um, uh, in clearer water especially, they can produce toxins and it looks like the water is in pretty good shape. Um, not, and, and it has happened in Michigan where they produce a toxin called anatoxin A and there've been quite a few dog deaths in different places. So uh, when you have bottom growth of algae on the bottom, it just requires a little more due diligence. And so, you know, the thing is when in doubt, stay out. If you see a lot of algae on the bottom and you're uncertain, just stay out. Um, it's the best thing for you, the best thing for your pets. See if you can uh, call somebody at Eagle and, um, and, and have somebody check it out or call somebody who might be a little more knowledgeable or grab a sample and send it off. Uh, I am a lot more conservative about getting in the water than I used to be. So in Michigan, turns out you can't, there is a, a number as well as an email to contact. Um, and this actually goes, uh, this email goes to Gary Kohlhepp. Um, so you can call and uh, have somebody come out and arrange to have the lake sampled um, and see if, it's a, see if it's an issue. So, you know, if you, if you see stuff, stuff on the bottom that looks awfully blue-green that you're uncertain about, if you see, you do the jar test or you have a floating paint-like bloom in your lake or it just looks like pea soup, it's better to, to find out for sure um, and, and make sure that it's not an issue. So let's look at some examples in Northern Michigan. So it's, it's really easy for me to talk about all these cool algae and all these different places. And you're like, well, I need to, I need to understand in my, in my home place and my, where I am at, where I'm standing, what does this mean for me? Because like, I'm like everybody else, I need to understand how it impacts my life in order to really understand how this whole thing fits together. There's a really cool German word for that called Gestalt. So let's look at Chandler Lake. In, in all of these lakes, with the exception of um, 
of North Bar Lake, I've actually gotten either images or samples from, and I chatted with the folks who sampled North Bar Lake. So Chandler Lake, um, which many of you have been involved in, this is such a cool image uh, that got provided to me, um, is, uh, is a drone image. And you can see down here, whoops, you can see down here that that there's a green cast to the water. Um, the uh, local or the closer up image from the water almost looks iridescent green. Um, and notice that it is actually below the surface. So that's your first clue. It's below the surface. Remember that blue greens, especially planktonic ones, have these things called gas vesicles. They can float up to the top and get trapped up there, but they tend not to really modulate their position in the water very strongly because they don't have flagella. They can go up, those gas vesicles, they can photosynthesize, produce lots of carbon, carbohydrate, those things collapse, they go down, they can go through that cycle a bunch of times, but they don't really have flagella. So they're not gonna be able to stick up there for a long time. Um, and this is a jar uh, of that same material. So I became involved in this because um, I think it was Ralph originally contacted me and said, hey, can you take a look at this? We're a little concerned and um, we're worried about this bloom in Chandler Lake and Eagle has done some toxin testing that's not back yet. And I, you know, I'm always like, send it to me. So they sent me some, they sent me a picture first. And I looked at the picture and the picture confused me. And so I said, you know what? I, I can't tell for sure. Um, I think it might be a colonial green, but I need to see the material. And so, they uh, sent me all these great pictures and then they sent me the material. And um, there, was, there, was some, there was some real concern that it was a blue green bloom. And so they sent me the material and this is a picture of what I received. Um, it was awesome. I think it was Aaron drove it down um, from Traverse City. So that's a, a long drive. So thank you very much um, for driving it down. And what it was, was something called Eurogonopsis, which is a colonial chrysophyta golden brown algae yellow, yellow, brown, depending on which common name you like. So these things are actually uh, in, a, in a gelatinous, very loosely associated in this gelatinous ball. And because you're a gonopsis, see that little area right there and that area there and this area here, that's where they feed into the, uh, the colony, but it's not like they're attached. So they don't like to be contained. As soon as you put them in a bottle, as soon as you put a cap on that, they are gonna start falling apart and swimming individually in the sample. They were still quasi in loose colonies when I got it. Um, but the picture I have to show you in a moment, um, they're completely dissociated. As soon as you preserve them, they split. So what these things do do is they do produce TNO and they do smell and they can get very dense in the spring. So what it tells you is, is it, yes, it's a lot of algae. Yeah, it's all one kind, it's not very edible, but it is a common spring algae. Uh, if I were to sample in New York, I would see it all the time. And so like Lake George, there's always Eurogonopsis present. It, the old name for this was Euroglina, uh, if some of you don't kind of recognize that opsis part to the end. Um, it is, can be an issue for water treatment plants, but it is not a human issue. It's not a plant, uh, a pet issue. It's not a wildlife issue. It's not a bird issue. So um, it can look very dense. It can get an eerie color to the water, but it's something that is there all the time. And it, you, you just had a particularly dense bloom of it this, this spring, probably because we got warm and then got cold. And so normally with some of these chrysophytes, with these colonial chrysophytes, you see them come on in the early spring. As it gets warmer, as the nutrients start to get used up, they don't like to be hot. Most chrysophytes don't like hot. And so as soon as the water warms up a fair bit, they kind of fall out or become a subdominant in the assemblage. But remember we had that real warm early spring and then, and that was pretty a long, pretty long period. And then all of a sudden, boom, it was cold and it was cold for a fair bit of time. And so it allowed them to persist in the water and to get more dense than they would have otherwise. So these are plants by nature, even though they're kind of sort of protists as well. And so they're going to, they're going to react to how much light, how warm it is, how many, how many nutrients or how much fertilizer is there for them. And then we go to the other stuff of how much they're eaten and how they can stay in the water and, and the more um, ecologically associated things for them. So in the end, luckily it turned out that it was not an HCB, it was a chrysophyte and 
Um, I imagine it has gotten quite a distance, quite a lot distance since then. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, it was kind of scary and it might not be optimal, but it's really not a big issue for the lake. And, um, and part of the concern is, is that because of the heightened concern over whether these HCBs or these HABs are persisting in our water, which they are in some places in Michigan, um, people see algae and they automatically go to algae is bad. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, Spider Lake. So Spider Lake, I actually have not received samples directly from, but Carol was nice enough to send me some cool videos. And we practiced with, um, with taking uh, video grabs uh, and, and screenshots. So Spider Lake, uh, and this is a beautiful picture, um, has a fairly defined literal area. And in that literal area, you're getting a lot of algal mats. And so it is a problem for swimming and it's a problem for access. It looks uh, dense and unsightly. Fish aren't gonna like it a ton, but my best guess is that um, this is uh, algae that's kind of a combination of Spirogyra and Zygnema and Megosia, which are these common kind of cloud algae. I love this video, it made it super easy for me to figure things out. Um, notice that she, uh, she's got a strainer and she's pulling this up in the strainer. And that tells me that, okay, it's got a lot of cohesiveness to it. It's got a lot of robustness to the mat. The mat, if I were to pull it up, it's gonna come up as a mat. It looks green. It doesn't look brown. It doesn't look blue green. It doesn't look purple. So that tells me it's a green algae. Maybe a colonial filamentous chrysophyte, but that tends to look a little different. Um, probably, uh, and Carol would have to tell me, I don't know, she played around with it, but um, probably was a little slimy. Whether it's slimy or it's kind of brillowy tells me whether it belongs in the Clodophora group or in the Spirogyra group. And um, it tells you there's a lot of nitrogen and it tells you that that nitrogen is pretty freely available to these algae and that um, those mats will probably increase over time. I think that for many of these lakes, and I think it's really pivotal in Torch Lake, that um, having ice cover for less period of time in the winter, it's a climate issue, is uh, encouraging algae to grow, gives them a longer lead time to grow, and allows these growths to get bigger, um, along with some things that, that we're gonna talk about at the end. So when I look for, okay, is this a blue-green bloom or not a blue-green bloom, I'm gonna look for, a clear margin to the edges of this. I'm gonna look for this to come up in the water and have kind of a 3D um, confirmation to it. So blue-green blooms might have bubbles, but they're not necessarily gonna, gonna float up on top of the water like this and be 3D. Um, and they're gonna be light green to, to, to a pretty robust green, a plant green. And you're gonna be able to do this with a strainer. Now, if it were felty or velvety, um, then I would be a lot more likely to say, okay, well, that's a blue-green off the bottom. Um, and if it looked like paint on the water, which we're going to look at in not too long, then I start to get a lot more uh, concern. Now, remember, this is a filamentous green algae. It's not going to have flagella. Actually, it has no way to, to modulate where it is in the water other than oxygen gets caught up in this mat and makes keeps it at the top. This stuff is gonna to start to, to die off. It's gonna look a little yucky. Um, it's gonna kind of get to be yellow and brownish, um, which isn't optimal, but, um, but for the most part, it's, it's not a huge issue, but it does tell you if you get these things persist too far into the spring and the summer, that it's gonna make it hard to boat. It's gonna make it hard to swim. And it's, gonna, it's giving you an early warning, quite an early warning that, yeah, there might be a problem here. There might be a, too much fertilizer in the water. And so you need to start looking at ways to, to, uh, to deal with that. And then we have Torch Lake. Um, and Torch Lake is, is somewhat infamous. Uh, it, it's a beautiful lake, um, but it has the sandbar that uh, people have these huge parties on. And, um, you know, and I'm, I'm assuming that those parties will continue now that COVID is over. Um, so it's a, it does have some deep spots, but a fair bit of the lake is quite shallow. It's a long lake, it's a dune lake, and it goes uh, right along Lake Michigan. And uh, they have a increasing history of this brown, uh, gold, what they've called golden brown algae, or, or really it's closer to a periphyte and crust growing on the bottom of the lake. If you, and I am a huge believer in historical memory. 
If you talk to somebody who has lived on this lake or been associated with this lake for 30, 40, 50 years, they will tell you that this is new to the last 10 to 20 years. And that prior to that, this, the bottom of the lake was quite sandy uh, without this growth on it. Now the growth, calling it golden brown algae is a little bit of a misnomer because there's lots of stuff there. Um, paraphytic or bottom growths, these crusts actually have a ton of stuff in them. They have diatoms, um, one of which is, is this one called epithemia. Um, they have fungal filaments, they have bacteria, they have blue-green algae, believe it or not, and they have a lot of sand and a lot of dead stuff. And so the way that these things grow is that you have your first crust start to grow, your first algae start to grow in the spring, as soon as the light gets high enough, and then they die and other, grow, other algae grow on top of them, and other algae grow on top of them, and other algae grow on top of them. Bacteria come in, the fungus comes in, and you get this whole milieu of stuff. And so it can get to be somewhat thick. And, um, and it's uh, notice how uneven it is. It's super patchy on the bottom. And so it, it's unsightly and it's disconcerting. It doesn't have any toxic blue greens in it. And we looked up in the water, we didn't find any uh, significant amount of bad blue green algae. I think we found a little bit, but it's always there to some extent. Um, but the water quality is on average quite good. And, and, and it is what we would call a, a oligotrophic mesotrophic lake. So it is a high quality Michigan lake, but this crust on the bottom and the fact that it's increasing in density over time is an early warning sign that we have an issue. Now, part of that I believe is associated with the fact the lake is shallow, excuse me, in many areas and that the ice cover is less because of climate change and that there's incoming nutrients that are coming in through the bottom. And so it's creating a, a perfect storm, so to say. They are still at the early stages of this. There's lots of, of chances for figuring out. We're still trying to figure out exactly where the nutrients are coming from and what the dynamics of this stuff is because it's a complicated system. It's complicated in terms of the water flow. It's complicated in terms of its structure. It's complicated in terms of its use. And so, um, you know, but overall, yes, it's not, you know, it's not awesome. Um, but, but it's not horrendous yet. And, and there aren't any uh, real bad actors in the periphyte and I didn't see anything that was a toxin producer. So then let's talk about North Bar Lake. So we have three lakes that we know have, um, have algal blooms, but not necessarily blooms that indicate, you know, health issues or toxin issues. And then we have North Bar Lake, which is in Sleeping Dunes National uh, Park. I love sleep or uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes. Um, I've been up there many times. Um, I'm not sure I've actually been on North Bar Lake, but again, it's a dune lake that has intermittent connection to the big lake. So this lake can be isolated or it can be open to the big lake. And um, believe it or not, last summer, it was uh, closed off for quite a bit of time and then it would open intermittently and then it would close off again. And um, thank you to Carol also who, who sent me the, the link to this lake. So when you look at this lake, it actually is quite a beautiful lake. It's shallow. It gets a lot of, a lot of use by folks. Um, it's, it's like a little pool in essence. Um, but this happened last year and evidently it's happened before, but it's not been documented. And this is that paint on the water. And, and there's not a super clear horizon to this. It kind of comes in and out and there's other algae under it. And it looks like somebody literally spilled paint on the water. Um, this is uh, probably microcystis is my best guess, although I have not seen microscopic material, so I'm not positive, but pretty sure it's microcystis. And, um, and it was producing toxin. So it was producing measurable toxin that was well above the EPA's, uh, the EPA does not have any regulatory um, numbers, but they do have eight micrograms per liter as a threshold to think about posting for contact um, because you don't want to be in the water when the concentrations of, of microcystin are above eight. And, um, and it was definitely a problem for, for the whole lake at certain parts of the lake. These things tend to get windswept over to shores uh, uh, depending on where the winds are blowing. Now, if, what, if we're right, um, and this is microcystis, Microcystis in North Bar Lake, like Lake Erie, is exasperated by the presence of invasive quagga and zebra mussels. And the reason for that is, is that um, zebra mussels are picky and quagga mussels are picky and they don't like everything. And they don't just not eat the microcystis, they spit it out. Um, on the other hand, they eat everything else. 
So it's like a perfect storm. The waters are getting warmer. There's more light. The zebra quagga mussels, and I say those together because it's very difficult in the larval stage to tell those apart. And it's about a, a 80%, 20% in many areas of quagga to zebra. Um, zebras came first, quaggas came separate. They come, they're the same genus, but from different areas of the world. Um, and they preferentially spit out the microcystis, eat everything else, and then all of their excretions are at the bottom where the microcystis starts to grow in the spring, in the early summer. And so all of that stuff favors microcystis. And often where we have these, not only the big lakes, but the smaller inland lakes, and these smaller inland lakes, um, you know, get these big growths of microcystis, they are often toxic. So my best guess, I would love to see some material from that lake this summer. Um, I would love to go on a, on a road trip and actually visit some of these lakes this summer. Um, but my best guess is it actually is microcystis. And so in a jar test, this would clearly float to the top and there would be nothing big in there that would have, you know, roots and be, you know, mac what we would call macroscopic. It's gonna be all tiny stuff. Even if you do see colonies, they're gonna be itty bitty. And, um, and it's all gonna float to the top of the jar for the most part. This would be definitely one that you would, would need to be concerned about. So what, you know, these problems, right? We know what the problems are. The problems are there's scums. The problems are there's uh, associated with those scums or there's really high algal growths. We have fish deaths, we have animal deaths. Sometimes those fish deaths are, are associated with a lack of oxygen. All this stuff dies at once. Oxygen tanks, fish die. Um, sometimes it's associated with toxins. And, and even if it's not necessarily a blue-green, like, you know, Lake Michigan especially has issues with Clodophora, it can really impair use, right? You get all this Clodophora over everything. When that dies, it gets yucky, it smells, and the oxygen tanks and it kills things. So not all the bad stuff is associated with algal toxins. So then the question becomes, what can we do about it? Now, there's a ton of stuff we can do about it. It comes down to what can we do and what will we do? And, and those are important questions, right? Um, so uh, the first thing you can do is when in doubt, stay out. If you see a bloom and you are uncertain about it, just stay out of the water um, and then contact somebody who can help. And, and we have a number and a website and an email to do that in Michigan, which is awesome. Other areas of the country, I know there's other folks in other areas of the country, I know Wisconsin Department of Health um, and also Wisconsin has a very active lake association on the east part of the East Coast, there's the collaborative, the Cyanobacteria Collaborative, Monitoring Collaborative. It's an awesome organization. Um, anybody has access to the app Bloom Watch. And, um, and if you go to the CMC Collaborative, you, you can download that app. And uh, that is global. So you can put your bloom in there and see where other blooms around you are. It's an awesome app. And that's open to anybody who would like to use it, but it was developed um, on the East Coast by uh, Shane uh, Branton and some other folks. So let's talk about what we can do. So when we start with this, the first thing is, is that um, it's flogging a dead horse, but inspecting septic systems and drain fields is low hanging fruit. Michigan is the only state without a statewide sanitary code, yay us. And so um, most of the inspections on septic tanks happen at point of sale. So when a property is being sold, that may be the first time since the, uh, either the property was bought or the septic system and drain field were installed that they actually inspect the septic system. Same thing goes for wells, actually. You should inspect your well and test your well every year. Some of you are cringing because you probably have never tested your well. But if you're in an old cottage and that is a shallow well and you are close to a lake or stream, there's a very good chance there's connection between the lake or the stream and your well. And so you need to get it tested every year. And you want to get it tested not just for E. coli, but you want them to do an algae test as well. Um, and that's just looking really for the presence of lake algae in your, in your, in your well water. Um, it's a good idea to have your septic system inspected every year. And if it's not functioning, then you need to either redo your, your septic tank or, or do a, there are things you can add to your septic tank to make them work better. The one thing you want to happen is you want to have all those nutrients from the waste from your household digested in the septic tank and not making, you know, having lots of nitrate and lots of phosphate make it out to the lake proper. 
The other thing uh, also is to understand what's happening to your gray water. So if you have, if you're at a cottage, it's a very strong possibility that the water from your dishwasher, your sink, your shower, it, your laundry is going directly out to the lake. And so you need to know that and, and come up with some way to deal with the nutrients that are flowing out that way. Uh, encourage native plant beds. Um, if you like to fish, I love to fish. Um, I am primarily a bobber fisherman because I generally had little children, had small children, and now I have small grandchildren. That's hard to do fly fishing or even casting. So I tend to bobber fish. Um, I'm happy as long as something's happening. Um, you can't have five pound bass without having plant beds. They need a place to be. You need a fishery. You need a place for them to hide. You need a place for them to spawn. You need a place for their food to be. They need cover and structure underwater. So trees and, and native plant beds that have a high diversity, that's where you see the best stuff. If you have, if you, if you wanna be able to get a, get a boat out, create a channel. And if you want a swim beach, just create a small area around your swim beach so you can swim out to open water. But um, you know, having, a, having native plant beds is one of the best ways, you know, the plants, something's gonna use those nutrients. So if you don't want the algae to use them, allow the plants to use them sequester them in the plants. Um, you might think about buffers. Having native plants at least 10 feet deep um, on your shoreline, preferably 30 to 75 feet deep. If you're in New Hampshire, the uh, buffer requirement, I believe, is 75 feet. So um, having that depth of uh, plants there that have super deep roots, lots of fibrous material. They're going to suck up that stuff before it flows over your property into the water. So again, it's beautiful to look at. Uh, you can create all sorts of either structured or, or more um, English garden type gross. Um, I love native plants. I, I garden extensively with native flowers and um, beautiful flowers. You can discourage geese by doing zigzag paths through your, through your buffer so they don't come up onto your property, big plus, and, um, and allow trees and things like that to grow and just have certain paths for you to look down to the water. It is huge for water quality to allow native plants and, and up on the upland for the filtering capability in the water to suck up those nutrients and provide habitat for fish and for waterfowl. Um, limit lawn fertilizers, uh, herbicides and pesticides. When you fertilize your lawn, especially if you're in a lake area, that's going to flow straight off your lawn into the water. So if you feel the need to use fertilizers, keep it low, test your soil, know what they need, and use a granular fertilizer. So most, uh, most um, like health departments or conservation districts can do soil testing, uh, conservation districts extensions can do soil testing for gardeners to figure out, okay, am I low or high in phosphorus? Am I low or high in nitrogen? Where's my acidity? What do I need to do to amend that soil to get good growth? And not adding phosphorus when the, when the plants don't need it because you don't want it to just flow right out into the water. And getting your soil tested would be super helpful. If you can tolerate leaving your grass longer, all the better. Um, Control your boat traffic. Try to keep boats from uh, coming in right into shore, especially jet skis. They have super powerful engines. They're constantly churning up the bottom. It's better to keep that bottom stuff on the bottom. Um, and also controlling runoff from houses, parking lots, and ag areas. I noticed that's a huge push. Um, and monitor, right? You can't mitigate what you don't know is there. And by monitoring, it'll reduce the panic. Uh, but it's, it's hard when you don't know who to go to and you don't know who to call. So now you have a state number to call and um, you know, you're welcome to send pictures to me and to other folks. And there is that visual guide on the ITRC guide and that visual guide on the, um, on the Eagle site. They're very different, which is awesome because the more diversity of images you get, the better your, your um, feeling is going to be for do I need to worry? Do I not need to worry? Danger Will Robinson, not Danger Will Robinson. Um, so um, if you have any questions, now's the time we're going to address those. I will tell you, I'll give you a quick preview that uh, there is uh, these kinds of pictures at the end of this for both the planktonic greens and, and the filamentous, uh, planktonic blue greens and filamentous greens that tend to cause water quality problems. So Okay, uh, and, and thank you, thank you, thank you. I've got some questions here in the chat. And if you could keep your yeah. uh, that last slide up, that would be great. During oh, this, sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I also was going to put on my microscope real quick too, but let me go ahead and show this for a few more minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's get to some of those uh, chat questions, if you don't mind. Um, oh, yeah. 
incredible presentation, incredible amount of information. I know I'm going to be watching it uh, at least uh, one or two more times uh, to try to digest even a tiny Sorry, bit. Oh, I tend to go was, fast. It was awesome. <laughs> okay, uh, a question here. As a wildlife rehabilitator, I'm especially concerned about algae since I always get calls regarding the water birds and botulism. Can you address that? So there's a, there's a couple of things that go with that. So um, there's avian botulism, and then there's also uh, the eagle killer algae that um, botulism is, is a bacteria. It is botulism bacteria that tends to grow in dying in dead macrophytes and algae on shorelines. The avian one is a, actually a unique uh, species of algae that grows on the underside of aquatic plants and uh, causes it messes with their internal um, gyroscope and you tend to see birds swimming upside down, which is never good if, good if you're a waterfowl. Um, and that can be regardless of the avian, uh, the eagle killer is definitely an, a toxin. The avian botulism, that's one of the reasons for controlling greens and other kinds of algae and overgrowth of, of you know, dead and dying algae and macrophytes. So yeah, it, it is a problem. Um, knowing what's in the water, knowing whether that stuff is coming on and having good control, letting native plants uh, grow in the water and then and also on the shoreline to keep those nutrients out of the water always helps with, with those kinds of overgrowth. Well, thank you. Another question. It says, uh, join the webinar with concern regarding toxic blue-green algae as we are experiencing extreme levels in central te Texas lakes. Uh, unable to uh, swim and pets are at risk. Worried about Arbutus Lake. Can you share, you know, like your thoughts about Arbutus Lake? I know you talked about uh, Chandler and, and Spider and, and others, but uh, can you talk a little bit about Arbutus that you know? Uh, um, I don't know any. I don't know much about Arbutus Lake. Um, I, I know in Texas, I work on several lakes in Texas. Um, I, I might have done some work uh, on that as a singular lake. I've done a lot in Lake Houston. Um, and then some other lakes that uh, Chris Churchill samples with, um, with the USGS. A lot of those lakes have multiple taxa that produce toxins and it's the perfect storm, right? Um, it's dry, it's, uh, they're going through an unprecedented um, drought, it's hot. These things need a lot of time, they need a lot of heat. And the one thing I didn't mention is, is that once you hit in the water, a threshold of about 25 to 28 degrees Celsius, blue greens go crazy, remember they're bacteria. And they, they started growing on the earth when it was a much warmer earth. And so um, they do well when it gets hot. And unfortunately, Texas is hot. And a lot of those, there, there's not a ton of natural lakes in Texas, they're mostly reservoirs. And so reservoirs um, kind of act like lakes and kind of act like rivers. And unfortunately, instead of getting the best of all worlds, they kind of sort of get the worst of all worlds because of that. Um, and if you contact me separately, I can look through my database and I can look for that lake and give you a better idea of, of what I found. But um, unfortunately, a lot of these lakes in Texas are, are an issue. Thank you for that. Uh, another question, and this was answered by uh, Brent Wheat, who is director of our environmental health, uh, Grant Trevor's environmental health. But a uh, uh, question is about what about at the 39 foot depth on Chandler Lake, there was uh, thought to be possibly toxic bacteria. Uh, what causes this? And Brent said that the that sample came back negative, but uh, can you add anything um, to that? Yeah, so this was an interesting, the Chandler Lake actually was, was a great study on what happens when, um, when people are just starting to make their connections, right? So uh, if you've ever played fifth grade uh, telephone, the, the message gets changed along the way, depending on what, what's important to people and what they key in on. And so uh, there was a, somebody was worried about there being toxic algae in the bottomlands. I actually talked to, um, talked to, to that person and I, or emailed to that person and talked with the health department. And it was, it was more or less a misunderstanding. And so what happened was what should have happened, right? So people were concerned. Um, I actually, I have these, these samples here. Um, and I have a, a deep bottom sample from Chandler Lake and all that was in it was, was dead urogonopsis uh, from the surface. And so um, the, the thing is, is that People were concerned. They went to Eagle. 
uh, Eagle came to me or, or somebody associated with Chandler Lake came to me. I looked at the sample, Eagle went back and did the, went back and looked at the toxin data. And between all of us, we were able to form a complete picture. And so good communication and good connection, which is what polls whole purpose is, is, um, is what's going to help solve these kinds of issues. And so there was a, a concern at first that, that there were toxic blue greens that were floating down to the bottom, but it was just dead and dying uroclinopsis and other algae. Um, I didn't see anything that indicated that there was a problem. Thank you. I uh, got this question. I'm not sure if it's um, one you can answer, but is anyone recording the levels of oxygen generated into our atmosphere from the Great Lakes? Um, you know, I know that NOAA uh, does a lot of modeling. Um, I don't know if they are specific, if there's, it tends to be kind of hit or miss depending on what the research projects are. I don't know if that's going on right now, but I know that there have been studies about that in the past. Looking on NOAA's website is the best way to go after that because they're pretty transparent with their studies. Thank you. Um, another one here. Uh, can you comment more about the effect of climate change on algal dy dynamics in our lakes now and into the future? You have that, <laughs> that is a big, yeah. So uh, just like real estate, location, 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 right? So the thing is, is that the effect of climate change, because I climate change is, is hard to, to characterize because yes, there's an overall warming in the globally, but some places get colder, some places get warmer, some places get wetter, some places get drier. But for us in the Midwest, the effect is where we kind of sit is, is that less ice cover. Um, based on the latest paper I've looked at, about 20 days less a year. So we're icing on 10 to 15 days later, we're icing off 10 to 15 days earlier. That means almost a month less of winter. And so I, uh, ice is a great way to keep light diminished in the lake. So as soon as the ice is gone, the lake has more light and it heats up faster. So if it's heating up faster, then that gives blue greens, which have a long lead time, but once they get there, they explode, right? So over time, it's going to give things like these algal crusts and torch lake longer to grow. So it may just have been that 30 years ago, the ice cover was extensive enough. It limited what could grow on the bottom and what could get going. So they just never noticed it. Um, not that those things weren't there, but they weren't there in spades like they are now. So part of it is there's more nutrients coming in. Part of it is, and that's also driven by climate change because we get these bigger rainstorms. Um, we were, hor in my part of the state, we were horribly dry, like August dry. I lost native plants in, in some of my school gardens. I've never lost. Um, and then all of a sudden we got two inches of rain overnight. Well, most of that didn't go down. Most of that went over and it took a ton of fertilizer and nutrients when it did. Mm -hmm. Those events are increasing with climate change. It's the perfect storm, right? You get warmer temperatures, more light, more nutrients, um, and things explode. So as climate change progresses, it's gonna get worse for us. As we modify our environment, um, humans are so successful because we can adapt. Um, humans are so destructive because we can adapt. Um, thank you. Uh, can you uh, please elaborate a bit on the effect of boats uh, turning up the bottom lands and you know what it's doing? Is that uh, uh, the domino effect of that? So it's an interesting effect. It's um, kind of a yin yang at the same time. So when you have boats with big engines, um, like like cigarette boats, big boats, jet skis have really powerful engines for the size of vehicle that they are. Um, they churn up the water and it has two effects. One, it brings nutrients up into the water column. It, it is destructive to macrophytes. It destabilizes literal areas and shore areas. Um, but it also adds particulates and clays to the upper water column, which shades out algae. So it's doing two things at once. And so um, it kind of, it, overall it's destructive to have those boats come in. Having a no wake zone preserves uh, shoreline, close to shoreline plants and keeps the, what might be the more nutrient rich upper sediments down on the bottom. Um, 
but then when you clear the water, uh, you might find that you have a little bit more algal growth up in the water column for a short period of time until the plants kind of come up and take over. So it's, it's, a, it's a dual effect of having those boats uh, in near shore. Plus it, there, there's actually some pretty good evidence to show there's also a, um, a safety issue the more boats you get. You know, you get a bunch of jet skis and a bunch of big boats. They're churning up the water all the time. That causes issues, but they're also somewhat dangerous to other users. Hmm. Interesting. Um, another question I've been noticing, especially in the back bay areas of Spider Lake, um, large, well-defined, gelatinous-looking green globules of algae, say two or more feet in diameter, which float in the water column. Um, they don't lay on the bottom nor uh, float at the top. What are these? Well, there's a few things that could be. There are actually some um, colonial protists, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this. Um, I'm not gonna say it right. Ophiophyta um, that are have endosymbiotic greens that um, they look kind of like big gelatinous groups. They could partially be bryozoans, also big gelatinous groups, or they could be these. Uh, Spirogyra and Cygnema and Magosia are all in this group of algae called the conjugales. And they, are, um, they float kind of in clouds in the water. And when they get dense enough, they just sort of accumulate enough oxygen that it, they hang out right, right at or under the surface. And so um, it could also be those as well. And um, the ones that I saw in the pictures that Carol had the videos of, those were all green algae, filamentous green algae. Um, but those other gelatinous algae um, could either be the be that kind of algae less less developed. It could be some of the rhizoans. It could be the protists. Also, could be there's a, a blue green algae called the Phanotheci stagnina, and um, pretty common in literal areas. And I've I've had those sent to me from Northern Michigan lakes before. Not a bad algae. It's just too much of it. Um, but it doesn't produce toxins, doesn't cause a problem. It just is yucky to look at and uh, has that, that warning Will Robinson look to it, but it's not a problem for the environment really. So mm. that is a really non-specific answer to your question. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, another one, uh, can the effects of uh, dermatoxins be confused with parasitic uh, swimmer's itch and vice versa? Could be. Um, so, um, just as a reminder that uh, swimmer's itch is actually uh, parasitic. It's we are we we are not the primary host for the for the parasite, and so it goes from it, depending on which one it is, goes from either ducks or fish to snails and back again. And it just happens to find us by happenstance, and so it'll burrow under our skin and die. <laughs> Yay! That's lovely to envision, and it causes a localized allergic reaction. That's the itch. If it's uh, low enough, then, and you get a over, uh, generally you tend to see the lines with swimmer itch, but not always. And so, you know, you could confuse it with the dermatitis from something like microsyra. Um, if you have enough algal toxin in the water, that can cause a dermal effect. And so just like with any algae can, that's dense enough can cause TNO, a lot of the polysaccharides that form the sheath have a have a irritating effect on your skin as well for blue greens and some greens so it can be confused yeah thank you uh we're down we got about five minutes remaining we've got a, just a couple more questions here um one is torch lake west side is very shallow how do you plant a 10 foot deep buffer or a plant buffer 10 foot deep well, so when I'm talking about 10 foot deep, I'm talking about the shoreline up the shoreline. So 10 feet up the shore um, and then letting native plants grow around the periphery of the plant, which often, you know, for Torch Lake, I imagine that quite a few of those native plants were originally Kara's because um, Sandy Kara likes sandy bottoms. Um, so when I'm talking about buffers 10 feet up to 75 feet deep, what I'm talking about is from the edge of the shore up the yard. So having this nice deep group of plants that the water that's coming off of your property has to filter through before it gets to the water. That's a good question. I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was confusing about that. Thanks for the clarification. Um, one last question. Um, you also have the net-like appearing green colored algae in late summer on Spider Lake. Uh, uh, please you know, share whatever information you can on that. So the hydrodictyon, the water net, um, so 
based on the early images I saw, which were all filamentous greens in the conjugales, right? Which like nitrogen, hydrodictyon loves nitrogen. So that tells me that you have a really, your whatever uh, runoff you have is super high nitrogen. Um, the good part about that is, is that it's not likely, at least in the short term, to switch to blue-greens because most of the toxic blue-greens like low nitrogen, high phosphorus, so that N to P ratio is super important. On the other hand, if you have a lot of hydrodictyon, that tells me that uh, you need to get a handle on that because hydrodictyon can cover lake surfaces. Um, don't often see spirogyra do that, but you. But I have seen hydro, I've seen hydrodictyon make lake surfaces unusable. So it, the, the lake is telling you that you got a lot of nitrogen, and you need to figure out where it's coming from. Thank you, thank you. And <clears throat> well, um, the last comment. Uh, it's not a question, but a comment, and it comes in. Um, it says, "Thank you for addressing our questions, and the presentation was incredible." You know, thank you so much, and we thank you so much, uh, Anne, for sharing your incredible knowledge. And uh, um, we look forward to You're the welcome. next series, um, and uh, which is going to be um, August 11th. And I'll turn it over to Patty and uh, to talk about the next series. And this is the Chandler Lake algae, by the way, just cool. so you guys can see it. Hi, I'm Patty Hersberger. I'm part of the um, Spider Lake, Runny Lake team that put on our three-part poll series. And we're very glad that you joined us today. There was a wealth of information shared. Um, and we, we appreciate Anne coming in. Um, and Steve Largent, you did a fantastic job moderating for us. Uh, there were complex issues. My head is spinning. I'm going to have to watch it at least a couple more times. It was great. Um, but for us, I think of one of the easiest things we can do to help control our algae and um, invasive species, which is segueing into our next series, will be all about our shoreline invasive species. So a little bit, this goes both ways. Um, and you may have seen it at your boat launch, the clean, drain, dry, and dispose. We can clean anything, we, anything before you get in the water, that boat should be clean, paddles, anything you don't wanna be contaminating from the previous lake, drain any of your water, you might be bringing algae in from somewhere else, drain your ballast tanks, uh, dry your equipment, look for species, look for plant life uh, and take and remove those and then dispose of your bait in any trash. Um, I'm trying to make this real quick here. Uh, to thank Anne, we really, like I said, we really appreciate you spending time, volunteering your time. And to, um, to thank you, we have a series of cards. These were from the Glen Arbor area by a Glen Arbor artist named Kristen Herlin. And each of these cards, you know it's a different season in the year, and you also get a frame to put them in. You can use them as a note card, you can use them as a picture, you can set them on your desk, put them on the wall, they're just, they're just really beautiful. And we'd just like to send that to you as a way to say thank you. And again, uh, our Poll series number three, August 11th, for invasive species. And we do like and to encourage all watchers, again, you can rewatch this series number two with Anne on the Grand Travers Conservation District's YouTube channel, which will be up, I think Steve said, one to two weeks, you can find it there. And also register for our next series. That can also be done on the Grand Travers Conservation District's website. And especially, we would thank to, like to thank all of you for registering. We appreciate that. And we know that our life is dependent on clean water and only people can keep it that way. And so we know science does prove that water is life. And with that, thank you very much.
Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.